Okay, this panel wins the record for the quickest setup time of the entire symposium. I just wanted to point that out. These guys are good. So anyway, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our panel moderator for the, for the uh, Secure Smart Communities panel discussion. And so I'd like to introduce Professor Richard Voiles. He's with Purdue Polytech. And uh, he'll uh, introduce his panel and take it from there. All right. Um, well, what a great two days it's been. Everyone having a good time, I hope? This has been all right. Um, excited students, man, this is great, with great students, excited faculty. Uh, we have excited uh, corporate sponsors and partners. Um, I think this is great. Lots of cool things being, uh, being ex explored and described. Um, some of it a little scary, really, when you think about it, right? That, uh, you know, the vulnerabilities we're discussing and, and the, the research and projects on addressing those vulnerabilities. Um, but, you know, that is, you know, wouldn't be worth it, or, or, or we wouldn't do it if, if we didn't think it was worth it, right? Um, because that's the advance of society, and that's what, in technology, right? And that also is what, uh, you know, is the risk, right, of interconnectedness. We're social animals. The original Trojan horse was a gift, right, between connected uh, societies. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's no different in the, in the progress of we may think, oh, wow, there are a lot of vulnerabilities with all this private, you know, we have privacy risks now and, and uh, outright security risks. Um, and, um, you know, we could say the same thing about um, the risks of a high-speed crash in a car, right? When we had horses, we didn't have too many of those, okay? But we died to, because it took six weeks or eight weeks to get across the country. Um, instead of just a couple hours, right? That's part of the trade-offs we do. And, and likewise, with our interconnected devices, the net gain, we feel, is worth it, right? And yet we have to build safety into these problems, right? And that's what uh, I, I just came back from a rotation at OSDP at the White House in, in uh, uh, D.C., and, and that was kind of my role. I was a, a technical guy, right? I'm a, I was the robotics and, and uh, um, IoT guru um, for the White House. But OSTP is about policy, right? It's about how technology affects policy and vice versa, how policy affects technology. And so my role wasn't designing the microprocessors and the algorithms and, and playing with the fun gadgets. It was trying to get people together to ask those questions. What is the right trade-off? What are the economic benefits that are going to result from greater interconnectedness? And yet, how do we, you know, interconnectedness, you know, brings in vulnerabilities. Um, and it's explaining to, to technical people, to non-technical people, to make sure the, the right parties are at the table, to get these things aired. And I think our panel is a nice, diverse, excellent panel for exactly that. You know, some of the things we dealt with in, in my role in smart cities and in robotics, you know, the FAA came into this and drone rules, right? And, 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 and some people would just come in and say, well, look, um, we just need to make sure that every drone has an ID. Okay, and, and it was kind of my role to say, well, but the best autopilots in the world right now are in the open source. And so if we force software on a drone so we can ensure privacy, we can ensure security, well, people will just pull out the software and put in their own because it's just as good and maybe better. Um, and then they say, well, we'll just lock down the CPU. Can't we do that? Well, no, because the best autopilots in the world run on little cheap Arduinos, right? They're not military systems. Um, and so they'll just pull out the CPU and put in their own. Oh, well then, maybe open source is the problem. That's the security threat. Well, you know, yes, if you don't design your defenses properly, right? It's that trade-off that makes this both scary and exciting, right? Um, and um, that is the nature, I think, of, of what we're talking about here and, and why this has been a good day. And here we are at the end of the second day, and we still have a full room. This is awesome. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is uh, let our panelists introduce themselves. Uh, I'm just going to go down the list uh, because we have some great people, and we're going to have them tell you what they do. Okay, and then we're going to open it up for questions and uh, welcome your involvement in this panel. 
So uh, Bob Lentz, um, if you could uh, uh, give us your uh, take on yourself. <laughs> um, well, um, I uh, was uh, an nsa -er, spent 26 years and as a director of network security at NSA and ultimately went to the Pentagon and uh, became the deputy assistant secretary for cybersecurity there and supported uh, three presidents while I was there and um, retired uh, after the first year of the Obama administration. And, um, you know, I have, uh, have been extremely passionate about many things in my era in cybersecurity. Um, the, probably the most passionate thing uh, before this uh, issue that we're talking about this afternoon was uh, helping to bring the, the Department of Defense and ultimately the U.S. government uh, into a strategy of leveraging the Internet uh, for defensive purposes because the DOD was stuck in the dark ages and, uh, and we realized back in the 1990s that we needed to to move the military to be effective globally as a power, uh, not only for wartime, but for peacetime, we needed to be able to uh, leverage the internet. And uh, it was a very, very difficult cultural issue in those days, as you can imagine. Uh, but uh, we got it done, especially with the unfortunate situation with 9-11. Uh, the resources were there. The biggest mistake we made <clears throat> in 2001 when we formed our strategy uh, with the White House is, uh, and everybody to this day was involved in it, when we get together, we'll look back, is that security uh, was not a major priority. And as a security guy, I was not very happy about that, but the goal of the DOD at that time uh, was to get connectivity, get content out there right away, get a buy-in from the troops and the warfighters, and let security catch up. That was the attitude. Um, and of course, here we are almost two decades later, and we're at a similar crossroads. And that crossroads is, is in large measure what this panel is talking about, which is how do we leverage IoT for the betterment of not only this country, but the globe. And, uh, and I'm extremely passionate about one thing is I'm not going to let us make the same mistake we did in 2000, which is not to make security a core element of the strategy. I'm determined to fall as much as I can on my sword uh, to ensure we don't make that mistake. Um, I was on the President's Commission uh, for the past year, and uh, we fortunately got IoT and cyber physical written in to the recommendations to whoever the president was going to be. And I'm confident that Congress and the White House is aggressively uh, trying to deal with it. But I'm only confident uh, to the point where oftentimes functionality often wins over security. Uh, but I will tell you that back in 2000, when we implemented the net centric strategy for the DOD and ultimately the US government, we really didn't have a lot of security solutions in place. So the reality is we only could have gone so far. But I really feel right now, more than ever, that we have in front of us some unbelievable technologies to allow us to deal with smart cities, to, al to allow us to deal with security to the point where we can beat these adversaries. And, uh, but we've got to work together, as the previous fireside chat panel talked about, to make this happen. I'm extremely proud of the fact that right here in this university, some of the brightest minds in Purdue, in the Center of Academic Excellence here, have put their thoughts together and have come up with some phenomenal technologies that I believe will be the building block for smart cities and IoT in general. I believe it will be a linchpin of where we're, going to do, where we're going to move, and that is the hardware root of trust and identity security built in uh, to, the, to the core fabric of IoT. And we can go into great detail on what that means. You've got phenomenal people here in Purdue that I think are going to revolutionize where we're going to go. And, uh, and I think this is going to be a step
that's going to change everything. A lot of what we've even talked about the past few days uh, will be dealt with aggressively if this technology gets invested and adopted. And I am determined to make sure uh, the U.S. government, at least, uh, puts the money in place to make this happen, which will then translate to smart cities. So that's it. Excellent. Thank you, Bob. Um, now, with uh, a much more human-centered view on, on this issue is uh, Denise Lee. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Denise Lee, and I'm a South African living here in the United States. I transferred to the U.S. roughly two years ago. Prior to that, I come um, from a fantastic little city called Johannesburg, which is one of the largest cities on the African continent. Um, in my tenure with Deloitte, which is roughly six years, I previously led the African practice for city solutions and emerging technologies. And I think when we talk about um, technologies as they are today, we need to bring it all back to the concept of what is, you know, what is their purpose, what is their function. Certainly on the security side, it's a massive, massive issue, but we don't operate in a vacuum. And when we talk about hard coding technologies, we also need to think about what does it mean for you and I as the individual. The concept of smart communities, of smart cities, of smart nations is effectively a system within systems. And that therefore pre-mandates uh, pre, um, that those respective systems, whether they're systems of transportation, systems of security, just the core data blocks that are, are floating around in the ubiquitous connectivity that is our digital economy of tomorrow, we have to figure out how all of these work together. And if we take it back to the human side and we think about us as humanity, how do we as individuals across different countries, different communities, between industry, between government, between academia, how do we start working together to create a solution today that will safeguard our, our survival into tomorrow? So when we look at all these technologies that are being developed today, the technologies for tomorrow, they haven't even begun to be thought about. How do we safeguard that? How do we safeguard ourselves? If we look at the millennials and some of the research that's been done, they're super comfortable to be able to give all, all access to themselves in terms of devices, right? So whoever's got the data on them, whether they're accessing the internet, Facebook, etc., they're very, very comfortable to have that open to anybody who needs it because that justifies their respective requirements. Us older folks, like myself, <clears throat> as some higher functioning introverts, are a little less comfortable to share that kind of information. So what does that mean for me? How can I safeguard my information while leveraging their information? And how does the government potentially look to leverage that where we bring these systems within systems together? And it all comes down to choice, right? Are we going to choose to be part of a solution for tomorrow and arguably give up a potential risk and be open to a risk that someone else is potentially going to be in a position to hack into my life story, my medical records, and everything associated to me to be able to safeguard tomorrow? Or am I going to try and hamper that regulation, policy, technology? And, and this is a question that we as individuals, as citizens, need to come to terms with with the support with government, with academia, with technology. Because if we don't, on some level, give it over, we don't have much chance of a sustainable future tomorrow because we're running out of the resources. We certainly are. So how do we come together? How can we bring the benefits of tomorrow in such a way that we don't effectively commoditize ourselves in the today? If you go today, there are websites that are available that can actually quantify how much you are worth as an individual with your data, your digital identity right now, how much you, or me, Denise, is worth in dollar terms today. And I tell you what, when I have a look at my value that's on the internet, it scares me because I'm worth a whole lot more than a couple of hundred dollars. How do we safeguard the fact that roughly two weeks ago, legislation has been positioned that ISPs can now own all that data about me. How do I safeguard to opt in versus opt out? Where are we from a legal perspective, a policy perspective? How are we as communities coming together to make sure that the choices that I make are indeed for the betterment of tomorrow, for, for my friends, for my family, for my children, for myself, without actually sacrificing their future through that commoditization process? 
That is something that I'm personally very, very passionate about. Technology in the cyber realm is absolutely one of the components that we have to consider. But again, within the systems, within the systems thinking, there are many, many parties that come to play in addition to the tech. Well, thank you, Denise. Um, and uh, Anupam, you're going to talk a lot more about uh, some of the uh, um, risk or, or the, the attacks themselves uh, from a technical standpoint, I think. But uh, introduce yourself. OK, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Anupam I'm from uh, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. So my take on this topic is uh, like when I moved from Germany to Singapore, I spent like 10 years in Germany. When I moved to Singapore, I immediately realized this is a country with uh, uh, technology fast track. Everyone is having smartphone. Everyone is uh, very, very keen and adopting to the new technology and uh, moving to whatever new coming up extremely fast. I had an old uh, Nokia phone with me coming from Germany, and I couldn't even find a SIM card that I will use for this. So I had to opt for a new phone. And uh, in recent times, when you have following this uh, news about uh, Pokemon Go, if you would go to the streets of Singapore, it would be extremely crowded. Everyone is looking for Pokemon. So I don't know about security at that point or not, but what I have seen for sure is it's very smart communities adopting to the new technology. It's very f fast. And uh, for my research in security, it was until 2011, I was uh, working on microprocessor design, hardware accelerator design. I was not <coughs> into cryptography or security, something like that. And a collaborator requested me, OK, can you design an accelerator for us, hardware accelerator for a cryptographic primitive? I said, yeah, we can do this. So you want it to be low power, yes. You want to low area, yes. Lightweight, fast, yes, we can do this. So we did that. And then uh, this collaborator said, OK, can you please make it resistant towards side channel attack? And so what's that? I said, OK, you should not release too much information about the power consumption. And then there are some techniques by which you can actually mask this power consumption, whatever dynamic power that's being consumed in the device. So we adopted that technology, and uh, we could show that some masking is done. Then they said, OK, can you prevent also any information leakage through the static power consumption. Uh, what's that? Uh, even the processor or the accelerator, when it's not doing anything, even then it's silently releasing information. And that's enough to capture the key or breach the confidentiality of it. And uh, we couldn't have any clean techniques at that time to block this. And then uh, we came to know about more and more such kind of side channel attacks and leakages, including fault attacks. And if you look into all the plethora of attacks that we have right now to this uh, hardware accelerators, it's mind boggling. And it's extremely lightweight. You can use a camera flash to perturb a memory cell. You can use this uh, hair dryer to heat up the chip and cause it to malfunction at your own will. And you can see the outputs, and you can recover some information out of this uh, circuit. Now, the bad thing about all this is you cannot release a software patch to correct it. If the hardware is designed, and if you can malfunction it using a Trojan or using a side channel, then it's gone. And in recent times, a very prominent example of this is a row hammer bug. Some of you might be familiar with this. That was uh, discovered by some researchers from CMU. And then Google showed that uh, it can be done in a very simple manner. You keep on writing a piece of assembly code in a part of your memory repeatedly. And then you can make some bits of memory flip, even without accessing those parts. So you can actually have a very high privilege escalation in your memory. And that defect is there in many laptops already there. You cannot release a patch about this. So this is almost an uh, end game for security, that you don't have a solution to a lot of problems when designing the hardware. And the attackers know this. So this is the situation that uh, we are in. And then, of course, the best way to stop it, uh, don't do any computing, don't do any communication, OK, then you're secure. Or you put a lot of access controls 
like what we call in the traditional uh, world is uh, operation technology or OT security. Only someone who is reliable would be able to access this or not. So we should be doing this ideally to prevent this situation. But what we are seeing, on the other hand, is we are actually giving them in the wilderness. So if you look into the Internet of Things phenomenon, cyber physical system phenomenon, then we are actually going to put all the device everywhere, which could be easily accessed and uh, <laughs> easily compromised. And one of those scenarios that we are observing right now in Singapore is uh, uh, we wanted to try out with smart traffic management. So it's a technology adaptive nation. It tries to different technology very quickly. So what they said is we have a lot of transportation options, like mass rapid transport, the um, cars and everything. But we also want to have something like a semi-rapid transport for the last line of transportation from the metro station to your home. There will be a platoon of autonomous vehicles, very small, semi-autonomous vehicle, and that would carry to your home. So this kind of things are being experimented right now. And there are a lot of researchers coming from the mechanical engineering background, automotive in engineering background, traffic uh, infrastructure background, <coughs> and of course, the uh, electronics and computer science experts, they are collaborating together to prepare a test bed to see how the autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicles can be put together to create a very smart urban traffic infrastructure. And this is the exact point that I raised there. I am part of this uh, collaboration, is how secure this is. And the ways you can actually disturb this, violate this traffic scenario, is numerous. So for example, you can compromise a traffic sensor so, so still really for a few seconds that the detectors would not be realizing that it has been compromised. And that can cause a traffic disturbance in another part of the city. You can change the electronic road pricing, forcing the behavior of the users to take another route. And of course, not to mention about all the compromises of the vehicle security that we also discussed in today's morning. So this is the situation that we are in. And we are discussing many different ways to put the countermeasures, of course, to have a trusted IoT devices to have some kind of attestation, knowing full well that there are many <coughs> devices that could be compromised. And I'm glad that in uh, the today's discussion, the topic is put as secure and smart community. And I will stress on the topic community, because it has to play a very important role in this transitioning phase, where we know about a lot of vulnerabilities for which the solutions are not clear. So it could come from the consensus protocols. It could come from the policy. It could come from the standardization. But the community has to enforce on how security is being adopted in the smart infrastructures. All right. Thank you, Anjipan. And uh, finally, uh, Young Shang. Um, oh, thank you. Um, OK. Again, <clears throat> tell us about uh, yourself. Uh, ah, there are your slides. All right. Thank you. Uh, first. For those people that are looking at page eight, how many of you know I'm a security risk here because I'm not Ning Hui? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretending to be him. Um, OK, so I'm an associate professor in electrical and computer engineering. In the last several years, I've been building a system to look at the global network cameras. Uh, how many of you, you counted how many cameras you were, can see you when you walk from here to lunch? How many of you tried to count that? Uh, once I was in, give a speech in a conference, and I asked how many cameras are in a room, we counted there were 17 cameras in that conference room. Um, and people didn't even, even notice that. Uh, I'm a computer system person. The reason we build this is we, we talk about big data. What's bigger than video, right? We have lots, lots of video all over the world. We want to analyze the, the data. So I have, uh, since I talk about video, I want to give you show a few slides, if this works. OK. So there was a, a, a report about three years ago saying about a uh, quarter billion surveillance cameras deployed worldwide. I think the number is probably a lot more now. Um, another book, HH uh, published in 2004, says there are 4 million cameras in UK. So you count about uh, every 16 person, there's a camera deployed somewhere. Uh, if you go to New York, they actually tell you there are a lot of cameras 
uh, somehow this doesn't work. Did I press the wrong button? Go on, whoops. <coughs> okay. Maybe most people don't even notice that. When we talk about smart communities, we often talk about sensors. And among the sensors, cameras are particularly interesting because they generate so much data, you need to think about things in different ways. Uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, somehow, uh, can you help me through the slides? Thank you. So imagine a situation like this. This was a flooding in, in Houston about a year ago, actually exactly a year ago. Uh, you can see the traffic camera in Houston. Um, the left side are taken on April 18 last year, and right side are taken a, a few weeks ago. You can see these are the same cameras. So the lesson here is you can use the camera to see what's going on in a city. Now what Texas is doing right now is they have a people sit, dozens of people sitting in front of hundreds of computers uh, looking at those cameras. But if you could analyze the data in real time by computers, it's possible to have a, a situation assessment in real time. It's not only Houston. Can you go to the next slide, please? Also, New York. This was uh, a project my student did a few years ago. My student said, I want to go to see the parade, but I don't have a money to pay the airplane ticket. So I said, let's go to see the parade without going there. And so we, we built a system. You can see the parade. It's actually better than going there, because you can see the entire parade from many, many cameras in real time. It's not only, can you, next slide, please. Not only New York. It's all over the world. All the data I show here is publicly available on the internet. Uh, so that brings in many interesting questions. Who owns the data? Who can see the data? Who can store the data? If you have access to one camera, maybe it's OK. But if you have access to the data in the entire city, what kind of information can you get? Uh, my student actually look at the, the cameras in New York City in Manhattan. And we were able to track a few vehicles across multiple intersections. Uh, we did it manually, but imagine you can do that by computers. So next slide is, it's not only outdoor. Um, in many cases, also indoor. This is a shopping mall. Um, my former student uh, was very interested in this because they want to improve their shopping experience, uh, their own and the, their, their family's shopping experience. Uh, so they start looking at. If you have the data, what can you do? In this case, think about people get tired and there are chairs. Uh, for the people they don't like shopping, but they have a family member that go, like, they likes to shop, you would appreciate the presence of chairs. There are many problems using camera networks. Some of them are very low tech. Can you go to the next slide, please? If you want to have a denial of service attack, you don't need any computers. In some of the cameras we've seen, we, we don't own them, but the data is publicly available. We see denial of service attack by birds or spiders. <laughs> um, those cameras may be deployed in places that are difficult to access, maybe along borders or somewhere. Uh, so that means your information may not be guaranteed. So the last slide, please. Uh, there are many opportunities and challenges. Uh, you can use camera to improve physical security. I have also seen one data center, uh, they actually use camera to improve their cyber security. They put a camera to see who's, whether the room has been break, broken into. Um, so they use camera to ensure their cyber security. You may be able to discover trend by observing data from many, many sources across long time. So that gives you some knowledge that may not be available today. Uh, Real-time analysis allows you to respond to emergencies. Uh, that is not available today. Uh, don't believe what you see in movies. They, they are still quite a few years in the future. If you can provide data from many sources, from camera, from sensors, from weather report, you may be able to get a much better idea about what's going on. That's not possible by using one source of data. There are also many different cha many challenges. Um, for example, data integrity and availability. Our system, we have more than 100,000 cameras in our system now. Uh, with that amount of the data, every day we, we see some cameras up and some cameras are down. How do you get information when you don't have a complete access to all the data you want? Uh, that, that's another important question. 
the, the research I started is how to deal with this amount, large amount of data. We, when I gave a speech in Microsoft Research a few years ago, the speaker in front of me said, we get several terabytes of data a year. When I started, I said, I get several terabytes of data a day. So that's the amount of data we are talking about. And we are not even close to the possibility. Um, if you get a, a trillion, a, a, a billion cameras, the amount of data you need it's beyond today's technology. Often today, use, people use camera as some kind of post-event analysis. For example, there's a crime. But very often, the, the knowledge about the crime, the report about crime is through a second channel. Somebody called the police. The police is not watching the, the data. They don't even know that the, the video has recorded the crime. Somebody called the police, and the police go, go back to see the archive of the data. Uh, if that second channel doesn't exist, even though you have all the evidence in your video, you still don't know what is there. Uh, again, the volume of data is too big. Um, I already mentioned the data quality. Also, uh, if you have camera outdoors, you get a problem with weather, birds, bugs, and so on. Uh, also, even today, the recognition rate for, for computer programs is still very low. As of last year, the, uh, one of the most popular competition called large scale image recognition competition hold, held by ImageNet. Last year, the accuracy was 67%. Uh, that's what state we are. And it was won by the, the top winners of big companies. Um, in fact, if you read the news last year, um, the competition was so intense, one company actually cheated and was called. Uh, if a competition, if a big company is willing to cheat, means that competition is very important. Even with so many companies putting so much resources, the accuracy is only 67%. So there's a still a long way to go using the data to create a smart community. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, and now I would like to uh, turn the spotlight on you um, and uh, see if, uh, what questions do we have for our panel? And I'm gonna start us off a little bit um, because we heard to give some, uh, um, you know, some of the technology, some of the technical problems uh, that we have, uh, you know, from even uh, uh, there was a comment about monitoring power for side channel effects. Um, and, and of course, we know about things, we talk about smart cities with smart power meters, right? Well, gee, if everyone has access to that, they can know when you're home, when you're on vacation, when you're away. Um, so the question to the panel then is, how in, in this society, how are the threats changing? How are they evolving in the future? Well, I'll, I'll just comment that going back to the camera example, I'll never forget that in 2010, I was in uh, Dubai and I was talking to the head of security in UAE and he said, you know, uh, if you remember the recent assassination of the Hamas uh, head of Hamas over in Dubai. I'm not sure if anybody remember that incident in 2010. He said that was a cyber attack. So I said, why was that a cyber attack? And he said, well, uh, uh, because the agents who came in to UAE, our country, and assassinated the Hamas leader in his hotel, basically took control of the camera system in the entire city from the airport to the hotel and back out again to allow them to go there and commit the assassination. Um, and, um, and so he said, unfortunately, we did not have very good control and security built into our camera system. And therefore, uh, the uh, event occurred. That could easily occur at the Boston bombing, as an example, because we all know how much we leveraged the camera system to uh, to capture the, uh, the guys that did that. Uh, but to your question more directly, it goes back to my earlier uh, comment, and this is what I told the general in UAE. If you'd have strong, very strong hardware-based security and identity built in to the camera system, uh, it would make it very difficult for an adversary uh, to, to take control of that system. They didn't want to knock that camera system, by the way, out. That's the last thing they wanted to do, because that would have set alarms off. They wanted to take control of that camera system, leave the images 
in a state that they were comfortable with, which is exactly what an adversary will do. Um, but we need to be able to implement the kinds of high assurance security, which we're not doing, as we've heard you know, many times over the last couple days, to be able to prevent those kind of attacks. Hardware-based security, which I said Purdue is working on quite a bit with, uh, with as an ADI, as an example, as a major company, will deal with issues like side channel attacks um, and, uh, and other kinds of, of, uh, of exploitation techniques. And, and that's why it's imperative on all of us to be able to raise the bar of security from the level that we're dealing with today, which is very low to medium levels of security, to that high level of security, much of which is even, we'll hear Ron Ross talk about in his wrap-up speech, is included in the standards that, uh, that NIST is uh, articulating as we speak. But that's a very, very important part of how we have to move forward in the future. All right. Denise, you want to respond? Or is there any, any yeah. response? Um, I think in addition to that, I think if we think about attacks in the future, just the last 10 or 15 years giving us a bit of a flavor, the attacks are coming from outside of our borders. Um, with, the, with the move to the cloud right now, and as that evolves moving forward, more and more data is going to be uploaded into the cloud. Um, the clouds are centralized potentially outside of our jurisdiction, uh, multiple jurisdictions, and there's a lot of layers of, of law associated with that. Now, depending on the culture in those particular countries, um, they may or may not subscribe to the kinds of security protocols that, that we would ultimately like to see and, and are able to safeguard ourselves here in a specific geography. With technology evolving as rapidly as what it is, especially the small IP-related generation that's coming out of emerging technologies um, and the emerging territories as well, that stuff has been slapped up into the cloud really quickly with fast adoption. Um, we're going to be behind the curve in terms of knocking that down as we evolve with time. We need, we need additional collabor collaboration in terms of communities as to how we're going to handle that moving forward um, to complement the hard-related security um, coding that we're looking to implement as well. Because otherwise, everything can be locked down in its physical device. But if we don't control that physical device, we don't control that security potentially. Thank you. Um, I think I, I want to echo a few points. First, I think collaboration is important. Uh, people understand security. They may not understand video. People doing video may not understand hardware implementation. Um, also, one important factor is the resource uh, issue there. You may have a great algorithm, but you consume too much power, then you are not going to use it. Uh, so there are many factors you need to be considered. Um, so I think uh, an opportunity like this with experts from different fields is a great opportunity to continue the conversation and to have a further discussion creating a, a solution that covers from a data source, from security, from the hardware implementation, and the low power, and so on. Yeah, I, by the way, I'd like to echo one thing the professor just said. I think that's one of the things that's very important as we move forward in, in the future with, with newer technology in this area is the fact that it has to be able to be low power. You have to be able to deal with the processing challenges, the memory challenges. Uh, and, and the security systems have to be able to last oftentimes 15 to 20 years when they're being deployed. Um, and so that's why you have to have a whole new paradigm for security as we move forward. I have a question for Denise. Excuse me. Um, you know, we've been doing a lot of work in smart cities. Uh, we, we deploy sensors as well as cameras and all these kind of things. And um, Singapore in particular, uh, it's interesting that um, what I'm interested in from you is what you see these cities in terms of their thinking. Because as we looked, as we worked the problem, it's more than security. In fact, uh, you know, they want because of the systems of systems issue and, and not understanding where the boundaries and where the data has really come from, there are instances in where we want the data to be available to everybody. So we want open public data, but we don't want it to be tampered with or spoofed because we're using it for decisions 
and, but we want everybody to have access to it, so we can't encrypt it, right? We have private data that we want to monetize, right? So we have to have different monetization models, yet we have to support this idea of privacy, security, rights management, and then we have the data that the government wants to protect, yet we want to anonymitize that in such a way that we can drive trends, analysis, and things like that while protecting privacy. So what I see is it's a real challenging issue, and because of that, we're in the process of deploying many things that don't address any of the needs that we're stating, that we, we have to have. So I'm interested with your experience and background, what do you see coming together in the way of uh, regs or standards, or how do you see the community beginning to come together to pull all these competing issues kind of together and bring the whole community together around these kinds of issues? So that's a great question, thank you. I think each, I mean the concept of what a smart city is, I think there's more literature out there today of what it is not if we look at definitions, right? Bodies have come together internationally to define what is a smart city, what is smart infrastructure. We've got the likes of the United Nations involved, you know, defining what smart infrastructure is, giving guidance. We've got the Smart Cities Council. Um, I think the important thing is, is the fact that they're not these bodies standing this up by themselves. They're collaborative entities, communities that are coming together to define what this thing, smart thing, should look like moving forward. And it's, it's, a, it's a, a collaboration between industry, between business, between communities, between normal citizens, um, as well as governance bodies and the government. And um, you know, whether it's about creating an open data standard to make information readily available um, that can, you know, all this information can be put into one really nice little bucket and we can slice and dice at the different feeds from the cameras, being able to interface that with the FBI's most wanted database as you're driving down the road using those cameras in the gantry because you've paid your easy pass. I mean, that's the ultimate vision of what this is. Um, certainly that comes with some choices. So in my experience working across the emerging territories, some of the, the trends that we're seeing now is is um, how we can actually get our arms around the areas of focus. Is this a new city that's been, um, been created from the ground up, like we're seeing the likes in Dubai? Um, we're seeing quite a lot in, in Africa that's happening now, Indonesia, etc. Or is this an evolving city where we have to rip out and replace existing infrastructure, like the London Underground, things like that? Because that, you know, the monetary element is huge. Um, and where we're seeing a lot of success is, is in those cities that have got a very clear vision where they've had that collaboration with the communities um, from a faith perspective, from a non-profit perspective, and how they've built a multi-channel a multi collaborative approach where everybody works together to come up with what this thing should ultimately look like. And it's not easy, it's not quick, um, and there's a lot of healthy debate. The core thing is the backbone in which all of this happens upon, right? So what does that infrastructure look like? And everything just seems to be coming back to the data, to your point, who owns the data? So in the event, um, it's, a, it's a new city, it's a bit easier with a new city because you're buying everything, you're dropping it in, brand new, shiny. Um, whoever's dropping in that broadband is able to say these are the, the guidelines that we're going to put on top of it. If we give you free access to the broadband, these are our terms and conditions in which we're going to play in the sandbox. And the more folks that are involved in that, in terms of industry, in terms of um, the community as well as the government, they're actually starting to, to create um, schools of thought, if you will, like, like a Facebook culture, right? That has no jurisdictional bounds. They've got their rules of what they're going to do and how you need to interact. And we're starting to see trends like that that's, that's happening today. Um, those are the areas where we're seeing success. Other areas in terms of the legislative component, um, the EU last year changed some of their legislation around differentiating between private data and public data. Um, and they've gone into quite a healthy breakdown of what that means. Again, it's, it's a work in progress. They've got multiple communities. They've got multiple sets of legislations in which to work with. Um, the telcos are absolutely, they have to be on board because they're the backbone of that. Um, and, it's, and it's a process, it's a journey. Yeah, but it, generally it's coming from specific areas of we want to reduce crime, we want to uplift the community in terms of job creation. 
and it's, it's, it's bite-sized chunks. I, I joke, uh, you know, it's how, how do you eat an elephant? You take one bite at a, pe at a time, yeah. It's a journey. Any uh, other questions from the uh, crowd? Be okay. <laughs> John, introduce yourself. John Walsh, with, uh, Vice President of Secure Technology at Analog. So what cities do you see as the leaders in thought leaders and implementation of, of technologies that support the values that, 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 that you see in smart cities and create the outcomes and, and, and the things that are you know, education, you know, all that kind of stuff. So um, every year there's a, a Smart Cities um, Global Award um, event, effectively, that's been created. Last year it was awarded in Barcelona. And they have a number of categories in terms of what constitutes being a smart city. Um, and again, getting to grips with what this thing is, there's multiple different types of definitions around innovation, um, education to the masses, whether it's sustainability, whether it's safety, so the reduction of crime, etc. Um, I think the, the key leaders, if we think about it now, is the city of Valencia around Barcelona in terms of what they've been doing in their rapid response, the ability to respond to an emergency situation in a really short space of time. Um, you know, we've got some, some uh, cities or towns, if you will, that are busy evolving uh, across Africa right now. The key drivers have been around the ability to maximize their water shortages with partnering with the government as well as large, um, you know, uh, alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverage companies to, to, to leverage the, the, sh the shortage in the water supplies and what they're doing on the, um, the smart utility side. But I think Singapore certainly stands out in the, in the top 10 around their smart buildings initiative. Uh, the City of London, from a security perspective, they can track you as you arrive in London um, until you leave London. Um, I, I smiled when you spoke about the number of cameras in here because I started counting the people and who's got a smartphone versus who's got a computer and both. I mean, we've probably arguably got, I don't know, well over 100 cameras in this room right now. Um, so being able to leverage that information with legislation, um, just because your phone is not on and you haven't activated your camera doesn't mean that you know big brother is able to connect to it and grab that information if they need to so i think there are a lot of different cities the uae huge inroads there um australia in terms of what tez has been doing um to assist some of the the, the counties in australia with the sustainability issues on on energizing them um i think there are a lot for, for different things All right. Another question? question. So, sure, absolutely. Uh, so I drove up here from Nashville a few days ago. I tried to stick to the main highway. I pulled off a couple times uh, onto side roads, and it's pretty shocking how many communities are kind of going out of business. They're, you know, uh, abandoned stores. It's very hard to even find a working gas station, you know, as you come up into, into Indiana. So I'm wondering, are, are there any thoughts on how this smart city technology could maybe expand outside the, you know, the city limits and bring some of these other communities into the fold of kind of, you know, new technology? <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I think if, if we look at, at the technology that, that is available today, um, one of the key drivers or initiatives in the Smart Cities initiative is on societal upliftment. Um, leveraging technology through, through Wi-Fi, through satellites, to be able to get education to communities that can't get to a city center, et cetera. And, and the key things around that is leveraging drone technologies, um, as well as hard, hard um, devices like iPads, Google um, Books, et cetera, to, to take that education to those communities. I think in terms of job creation and upliftment, um, the ability to port one's business today into a digital platform, I think, lends itself to be a, a good idea for certain environments and certain industries and less so for others. Um, but being able to, to, to think about smart banking, so doing your banking on your phone, um, there's new technology that's come out with, with large players like GE and Schneider Electrics, et cetera, with their light bulbs. You can literally go and stand underneath their light bulb and, and download your banking details onto your smartphone, etc. So I think you know, as as these devices continue to evolve, 
um, and they start proliferating the environment, if you will, um, whether it's sensors on the roads, the ability to track um, through social media analytics, sentiment analysis, etc., where people are moving and with the spatial geographic technology that's there with the planning of new communities, I think you know, the world is going to continue to evolve. I guess the key thing is making sure that we're leveraging the right technology in the right place. And then that kind of comes back to the collaboration with communities, how best to position that, because it, it could potentially be quite a sizable expense. You know, one of the, one of the areas that I was really surprised about um, when we were in Australia talking to their government, you know, was the, the smart agriculture area. It's just unbelievable the amount of innovation that's in smart ag uh, that's revolutionizing everything around the world. And, and we're just scratching, we're scratching the surface right now. The only other thing I'd comment on is, is while we will see these massive number of sensors being deployed, hopefully all secured, right, with very good security. Um, you know, the, the thing that's happening right now, I, when I look at innovation around the globe, uh, especially coming out of places like Silicon Valley, is we're really in the middle of a, of a machine learning arms race. Uh, because that's going to be the thing that's going to be the big differentiator when it comes to this area. And, uh, and then so, again, putting security into that process because the adversaries are going to get right, want to get right into that machine learning AI arena because that is the brain that's going to be controlling a lot of these sensors that are going to be there. Uh, but that's also why we have to respect the, you know, the issues like uh, data privacy and data rights management and all these other issues at the same time. So we have time for one more uh, quick, oh, you want to comment, uh, Nupam? Just, just to we're add to this comment is uh, I am not uh, old enough to understand how policies are designed and so on. But I certainly do have a feeling that the technology dynamics is too fast compared to the policy dynamics. And the time it takes to implement a policy or to come up with a standardization to prevent us from any technological mistakes, uh, that's too unbalanced right now. And somehow it has to be corrected. And uh, one thing that we cannot uh, definitely do is to slow down technology. Yeah. So the obvious solution is uh, automatic policies. Uh. <laughs> 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 so, um, Final question. Yeah, Denise had mentioned that uh, the definition, is this working? I think so. OK, that the definition of smart cities varies from place to place, as do the interests and needs of certain uh, cities around, around the world. And, each of you have, have mentioned some place that think you're doing it right. I would love to hear examples of people that think are doing it absolutely wrong or, are focus, or that you believe are focusing on the wrong things when they're trying to develop a smart community, a smart city. Excellent question. Yeah. Who's going to take that one on? <laughs> I'm scratching my head here virtually. Um, <laughs> I think, I mean, to do something wrong, you know, it, I guess it comes down to the agenda, right? Um, if the agenda has been driven in such a way that it is benefiting a component of, of society, um, you know, is it, is it wrong in terms of its nature? I mean, we could get quite existential here. Um, I think the folks that are doing it wrong are, are potentially those folks that are saying, we need a solution today and we're going to jump in with both feet and we're not going to consider what the potential butterfly implication is going to be by doing it. Um, and, and, and to your point, in terms of legislation, of right, but, you know, but I'm a firm believer that good can come out of that as well, right? Because if you think about some of the most amazing technologies that are around today, they were created in someone's garage and everyone told them that they could never do it, etc. I mean, if we just have a look at, at Epcot's you know, the perceived future, the future land. I mean, you know, it was Walt Disney's dream and it's a, you know, I, I'm, I guess where things go wrong is when we try and do things in isolation, right? Because then I'm only able to leverage what I know. I'm only able to do something to, the, to my maximum ability. And I think if we consider the aspect of smart, we consider, we consider the innovation index in terms of where we're seeing the most growth coming. It's from involving academia into that as well. Um, is it wrong? 
you know, I, I could argue that even the bad guys, in terms of their ability to innovate and do things that are really bad, compel the rest of the good guys to be better at what they do. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but good question. I'll, I'm definitely going to think about that again tonight. Yeah, I guess my, my perspective is that um, I think the, the mistakes that I'm seeing is, um, number one, I believe the paradigm for the way we did security in the last 15 years can't be applied to the future. And so the other point is that where the IT and OT come together, you know, we clearly want an end-to-end -end strategy. We clearly want to go from the edge to the cloud, and we want to be able to be pervasive. But um, we have to have security that's very agile, very lightweight, but very robust. And that means you have to have security designed to be very scalable, to be able to meet that IT to OT environment up to the edge to manage all these sensors, to deal with the AI issues. And so what we have is we have this massive, massive security industry that many of us were from, or are from, that are selling 20th century security with a little bit of 21st century pasted on. Bolt on. Bolted on, <laughs> right? And that isn't going to work. It's going to work a little while while the IT infrastructures are sort of there to kind of you know be there to kind of maintain stuff, but it isn't going to work in the future. It's going to quickly be obsolete, and that's why we need to have strong policies. And the only other comment I'd make on the policy front is that when we do smart cities or smart towns, to the earlier point on rural environments, it has to be a policy that requires that security standards be up at that level. So it's secure, smart cities. Your, you know. your thoughts and my thoughts are very much alike because you, uh, from my perspective, you're seeing plenty of people who have kind of taken the, the uh, like the old cell phone approach. Well, let's just get it out, and we'll a, a, as we find the problem, yeah. we'll, we'll throw security on top, we'll patch it all instead of really trying to invest in the front side. And I think there's a lot of communities that are trying to jump into smart cities that are just throwing things out there that are they're going to tie themselves to legacy that are going to be an awful lot of problems in not a decade from now, five years. From Two right. years from now, once it's up and running. Exactly. Look how much money it costs. You know, all of us experience this in our lives. You, 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 tax dollars are needed, so you build all these ma massive cities. Then you do the road system second, right? And we all wait in line, you know, to fight to get out of those, those cities. That's what we do with security. We build the functionality, but then all the amount of money it's going to take to recode, re redo security, you know, it, it just breaks the bank. And then everybody gets upset. But, but yep. to both of your points, I think we're today trying to build a solution for tomorrow. I mean, if we, if we just think back at the evolution of technology in the last four years, I think when the internet was built, it was built with the idea of sharing information. Um, and, and now we're trying to control it, right? So I think what we have today, to your point, um, having an agile approach for tomorrow, we are going to be going through that journey of ripping out and replacing because things are evolving so quickly. So, you know, we, we build on our knowledge from yesterday. Right. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we do have uh, another speaker yet. Uh, and so uh, uh, what I'd like to do is thank our uh, panel.